Good morning, everyone. It's good to welcome you to our service this morning in Down Road. If you're visiting with us, we do extend a warm welcome to you as we worship uh, God together. If you're watching later on or listening, we thank you for doing so, and we trust that uh, we will all know the Lord's blessing uh, this day. Let me make some announcements uh, for us uh, this morning uh, in our service. So next Sunday morning, our service at normal at half past 11. And it will be an all-age service back to school with God. And many of the children will probably already be back. All the children will be back by next Sunday. But it's good to begin the school year with them and to encourage them uh, back to school with God. Next Sunday morning, it's great to see all of our uh, younger families out uh, next Sunday. Then we return also to our evening services next Sunday evening, and we begin uh, in Ryan's next Sunday evening with the United Evening Communion Service. So we do encourage you to come along to that out in Ryan's next Sunday evening. As always, the prayer meeting precedes uh, the morning uh, service. Uh, Come September, then things start to start again after the summer break, and mums and toddlers will recommence on Monday the 11th of uh, September, uh, all being well, DV. And if you or someone you know who might be interested in going to mums and toddlers, you will be made very welcome. And if you wish to speak to one of the leaders in advance, please uh, contact Georgina or uh, Suzanne. For members of Kirk Session, we meet uh, briefly on Monday the 11th of September at half past seven in the minister's room, and then committee meeting at eight o'clock on Monday the 11th of September in the Annex. It is hoped to recommence Youth Club in the autumn, and if you helped with Youth Club in the spring and be willing to do so again, then please speak to myself. If you didn't do it then but would like to help with Youth Club uh, now, then please also contact uh, myself as soon as possible. Now, these uh, are the announcements. Let us worship God. We read in Psalm 108, My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Well, we join together in singing to God's praise the words of hymn number 215. Hymn number 215, Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it.
Well, let us pray. Our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we delight to sing the praises of your name, to sing of the greatness of your love, which is higher than the heavens, to sing of your faithfulness, which reaches to the skies, to exalt you, our God, whose glory will one day be over all the earth. Our God, we delight to sing the praises of Jesus, who is Lord. For by him, through him, and for him, all things were made in heaven and on earth. We delight to sing the praises of Jesus, who from his eternal throne came in the flesh and gave his life over to death on the cross to atone for sin, to secure pardon for sin, peace with you, and the promise of life eternal in your presence. Our God, we delight to sing the praises of Jesus because he is the Lord, the only Lord who saves. We praise you, our God, because Jesus, the only and eternal Son of God, is the promised Messiah, the true Savior of sinners, because he is the true and good shepherd for the sheep. We praise you, our God, because only Jesus can give eternal life to the sheep, and only Jesus can promise that none will perish, none will be snatched from your hand. Our God, we delight to sing the praises of Jesus, Son of God and Messiah, the true Savior of sinners and shepherd of the sheep. And our God, we praise you for the many blessings of that salvation which is in Jesus. We praise you that in Jesus we become part of your flock, adopted as sons and daughters and heirs of all that you have promised. We praise you that in Jesus we are sealed in our salvation by the Holy Spirit, the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, the presence of God in our lives, the power for living the Christian life. Our God, we confess our sin. We confess, our God, those times when we do not honor Jesus as we should. And so we do not live our lives in obedience to him who is our Savior, King, and Lord. We confess, our God, those times when we do not listen to the voice of Jesus and we walk not in your righteous ways, but in the ways of the world. We confess, God our Father, how we neglect to be committed to and love the flock by our words, actions, and attitudes toward others, which do not build up and encourage, but rather tear down, divide, and destroy. Our God and Father in Jesus, we confess our sin and seek your mercy and forgiveness. We confess our sin and come before you humbly that you might cleanse us from all our iniquities and blot out all our transgressions. We confess our sin that we might repent of our sin, turn away from it and to back to your righteous ways by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Our God, we thank you that your word assures us you are slow to anger and abounding in love and that as far as the east is from the west, so you have removed our transgressions from us. Grant us that assurance today. And we thank you, our God, for this day. We thank you that this is the day we gather together to worship you. We thank you, our God, for your many and gracious blessings to us. You delight to give and to give abundantly. And we pray that we have delighted to give generously to the work of advancing Christ, advancing Christ's kingdom, building Christ's church, and helping Christ's people in need across the world. Bless what we have given to the glory of Jesus. And we pray, our God, that in our gathering today we will delight to sing your praise and delight to hear your truth. Give us hearts that rejoice in who you are and all you've done for us, and ears to hear all that you will say to us. And hear our prayer, for we pray in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Now we turn to God's Word this morning. I invite you to open our Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke. 
Luke chapter 5 and reading verses 17 to 26. Boys and girls, I encourage you to listen well uh, to our Bible reading uh, this morning before you come up to the front. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, let us hear the word of God. One day as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave uh, praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. Amen. And we thank God uh, for his word. Well, boys and girls, you come up to the front. I'll come down to see you. Got to do that before the service. Well, good to see you all this morning. Are we all well? Yeah, good, good. Any, who's going back to school this week? Yeah, anybody back to school yet? No, not yet. There are some children back to school. Imagine going back to school in the middle of August. Shocking, isn't it? When I was your age, we never went to school in August. We only went to school from September. Then I was a little bit older. I got three months summer holidays. I thought that was pretty cool. Imagine three months summer holidays. What do you think? Would that be good? Would it? Would it? You all still, you all awake? Yeah? Good, good. Well, good to see you. Tell me this, boys and girls. Who likes to play board games? Does anybody like to play board games? Yes? What sort of board games do you like to play? Yes, Lauren? Cluedo. Cluedo. Well, that's a good one. Yes. Good. Yes. Do you always get the... Do you always know the, the, the right answer at the end? It would, like, you know, who did it? Isn't that the, who did it? Yep, yeah. yeah, do you get it right, do you? Yeah, I imagine you probably do. Yes, anything else? What else do you have to play? There's something called Power I like to play. Right, okay. What's that about? Uh, well, basically, you have different headquarters and you get different tournaments you can exchange for things like increasing. Okay. And your level sets and things. Oh, right, right, right. right. Okay, right, okay, yeah, one of the, okay, very good, yes, yes, what else? Monopoly. Monopoly, oh, that goes on for hours, doesn't it? Yeah, indeed, and then what about you, Fraser? Mm. No, no, well, I brought a game with me this morning, uh, maybe you know this game, does anybody know this game? Yeah, guess who? Guess who, do you know how to play it? Yeah, so, um, so uh, we have all these cards here with people's names and faces on them, Okay, so you hold that, Fraser, for a second. And then we have this board here with all the names and faces of all the characters in the game. And so what you have to do is, as you know, as some of you know, you have to ask questions. So you ask a question, is your character a man? Is that a man on there? You have to tell me, is it a man? Mm. Yes, yeah, so then I put down all the characters who are, who are women and so on and so forth. 
Does your man wear glasses? No. So put down the people who wear glasses, and then we finally get to the right answer at the end by asking the right questions. So it's called guess who. Do you have it at home, do you? You have it at home? Yeah? Do you have it at home? You have it at the caravan. So if you don't have it at home, maybe that's a good idea for a Christmas present. Uh, so yes, indeed. So you put that in there, Fraser. That's guess who. And you know, I was thinking about that game, and I was thinking to myself, you know, in the Bible, in, our, in the Bible, people were always trying to guess who Jesus is. Guess who Jesus was. They were trying to figure out, is he really, is he really the Messiah? Or is he really somebody, or is he just somebody different? Somebody ordinary who can do wonderful things. And so people in the Bible were always trying to figure out who Jesus was. And one day, the religious leaders, now they were the people who didn't really like Jesus, they asked Jesus if Jesus was the Messiah. What does the word Messiah mean? Yes, Thomas. Okay. Not quite, no, but you're, no, not quite. What does the word Messiah mean? Mm. Yep. Savior. Savior, yes, the one God would send to save us and rescue us from our sin. And so Jesus was asked, are you the Messiah? What do you think he said? Did he, did he say yes? Did he say yes? What do you think? No, he didn't. Did he say no? No, he didn't either. He said, look at the things I have done. Look at the things I have done. And so what do you think Jesus meant by that? To look at the things I have done. What do you think he meant? Do you think he meant washing his face and having his dinner? No, no what do you think he meant? Do you think he meant... All the miracles, that's right indeed, that's right indeed. And so maybe one of the things Jesus said they needed to look at was the story we read from, our, from the Bible a few moments ago. So he meant that Jesus probably meant the time he healed a man who was, how was the man brought to Jesus? Are you listening? How was he brought to Jesus? Was it through the front door? No. Back door? How was he brought to Jesus? Through the, roof. through the roof. Imagine having friends like that who would do anything to get you to hear about Jesus to get you to Jesus. So when the man was lowered through the roof, what did Jesus say to the man? When Jesus saw the man, what did he say? What was the first thing he said? Your sins have been forgiven. Have been forgiven. That is right. But who can, who, who's the only person who can forgive sins? Jesus, God. So that means Jesus was saying, I am God. I'm not just some ordinary bloke who can do wonderful things. I'm God who can do marvelous, powerful, mighty things. So the Bible wants us to know, God wants us to know and understand who Jesus is, that he's not just some other guy who came along, that he is the Messiah, that he's God, that he can forgive sins, that he can save us and rescue us and bring us to the Father forever. So when the Bible, when the, when the Bible wants us to not just guess who Jesus is, but to know who Jesus is. To know who Jesus is. Will you remember that? You remember the game, won't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember why I brought the game. Not to play it, but to help us understand who Jesus is. Yeah, why don't we pray? God, our Father, we thank you that uh, while many people in the Bible, and even today, are trying to guess who Jesus is, you, you, the Bible tells us who Jesus is. And we don't have to guess. And we thank you that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that he came to rescue us and to save us and to forgive us our sins. And help us all to understand that and to know its truth in our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, where are the hymn books? There we are there. Good man, Thomas. Thank you if you pass them out. And our, song, our next song this morning is hymn number 423, Thank You, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord for loving me.
Well, we come now to our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Our God and our loving Heavenly Father, we pray now for others doing so in the name of Jesus, who alone intercedes for us before your presence. Our God, as the summer months draw to a close, we pray, our God and Father in Jesus, for us, your people, here in this place. As we look forward to a new season of the year, the season of autumn, the season of harvest, that we will know your grace and blessing to us in our worship, our work, and our witness for Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that as we approach that harvest season in which we give special thanks for your grace and goodness to us in the abundance of the earth, we will be a people always thankful for your grace and goodness to us in Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that as organizations and activities recommence after the summer break, there will be a new enthusiasm and interest in the work and witness of our congregation. We pray for your Spirit to be at work in our midst, bringing new and renewed life in Jesus Christ, stirring hearts to greater commitment to Christ and his church, to prayer and to your word. We pray that we will be a people, a a flock under the care of the shepherd, which will know the reviving and renewing power of the Holy Spirit in our midst. We pray, Father, for lives to be saved unto Jesus Christ and added to his church. For we are saved not just for eternal life and the new heaven and the new earth, but saved also to be part of the flock. We pray, Father, for the lost sheep to be gathered into the flock. We pray for those whom we know in our families and among our friends who are not saved in Jesus Christ. We pray for their salvation unto Jesus. We pray, Father, that you will give us opportunity to speak of Jesus, Son of God and Messiah, to them, so that in hearing the gospel they will be brought to conviction and repentance of sin, and to faith and trust in Jesus Christ for eternal life. O God, by your Spirit, stir our hearts, burden our hearts, to see lives won for Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And hear our prayers, O God, for we ask these things in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, we read again from God's Word. We turn uh, to John chapter 10. We've been looking at this uh, chapter over a number of weeks, and we come to the to the fourth part of the chapter we want to read this morning. John chapter 10, verses 22 uh, to 42, page 1077 in our Pew Bibles. John chapter 10, verse 22. Let us hear the Word of God. Then came the Feast of Dedication at Jerusalem, It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered round him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy, because I said, I am God's Son? Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. 
Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Now, before we think on God's word, we'll sing again to God's praise the lovely words of hymn number 510, 510, Loved with Everlasting Love. A few years ago, uh, some years ago now, Rowan Atkinson, the uh, actor and comedian, was interviewed on The Graham Norton Show. Rowan Atkinson, as we know, is famous for uh, Mr. Bean and also the James Bond spoof, uh, Johnny English. But on the show, Norton asked Atkinson if he had ever been mistaken for Mr. Bean. And Atkinson responded by recalling a time when he was purchasing a part for his car one Saturday morning. And while waiting for his goods, another chap doing the exact same thing came up to Atkinson and said, has anyone ever told you that you have an uncanny resemblance to that Mr. Bean fella? You know, you could earn a few bob doing impersonations. 
Well, Atkinson responded by saying, I am the actor that plays Mr. Bean. But the more Atkinson tried to convince this chap he was Rowan Atkinson who played Mr. Bean, the less the other chap was convinced and actually became quite annoyed with Rowan Atkinson that he should dare to say that he was the actor who played Mr. Bean. And perhaps we can imagine for a moment, although this is a bit far-fetched, the Jews, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, saying to Jesus, well, look, we know the law and the prophets. And has anyone ever told you that you have an uncanny resemblance to God's promised Messiah? While the Jews did not ask that question, they were nonetheless trying to guess who Jesus was, trying to figure out the identity of Jesus. And Jesus asks all of us an important question. Who do you say I am? And the entirety of our lives and our eternities hinge on how we answer that one question. Today we want to think about the concluding part of John 10. Jesus has has taught that he is the true shepherd of the sheep, that he is the gate for the sheep, and that he is the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. And the Jews who heard Jesus speak these truths were divided about him. Some thought he was mad. Some thought, no, how could a madman drive out demons? As we come to this last part, we're told in verse 22 that it was the time of the year for the festival of dedication, or Hanukkah, which is today one of the most important Jewish festivals. It takes place in winter at the same time as as Christmas. Hanukkah Hanukkah did not originate in the Old Testament, but it does celebrate a great victory of Jewish fighters led by Judas Maccabeus in 164 BC against the Greek ruler Antiochus Epiphanes. He had outlawed Judaism, the reading of the scriptures, and temple sacrifices. And Hanukkah is an eight-day celebration of deliverance from the enemy. And is characterized by many things, including the exchange of gifts and the lighting of an eight-stemmed candle. So like at the time of Passover, the Jews at the time of Hanukkah were celebrating deliverance. And so they asked Jesus, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Of course, what they meant was, if you are the one who will deliver us from the Romans, tell us plainly. So how does Jesus answer this question put to him by the Jews? Well, not directly. Rather, Jesus, as we've already pointed out, points to what he has done, but also what he promises, and a little indication of who he is. At the heart of this passage, and at the heart of the Christian faith, is knowing and understanding who Jesus is. And what we learn from this passage is is two simple truths about Jesus. He is the Messiah, God's deliverer, and he is the Son, the eternal divine Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. The Jews want want Jesus to tell them forthrightly if he is the Messiah. How does Jesus answer? I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. Jesus points to his signs, his miracles, his works, as an indication of his identity. When we ask if someone is the greatest, we tend to look at what they have achieved. So, for example, to use an example from football, I do apologize, uh, Lionel Messi is considered one of the greatest footballers of all time. And, of course, he has the achievements to back that up. He has scored the goals. He has won the trophies. He moved to the USA a few weeks ago to play for uh, David Beckham's Inter Miami team, and he was scoring goals the first game and helping to win a trophy. So he has the. He, he, we can point to his to what he has achieved to say, yes, here is one of the greatest footballers in the world. Or we might think of someone like Winston Churchill, who is considered one of the greatest politicians in, in British history. And of course, we know that his greatest achievement, and this is what the whole, this is what people base their assessment of Churchill on, was to be a wartime prime minister in the defeat of the Nazis and their allies. We point to his achievements. And so Jesus says in the same way to the Jews, my works, what I have done, testify about me. My works tell you all you need to know about who I am and what I came to do. 
But the Jews failed to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And this was not an intellectual issue because they would have known the law and the prophets. It was not because they were ignorant of what Jesus did. Rather, it was because they were not Jesus' sheep. If they were his sheep, they would have recognized his voice and followed him. You know, on the day of judgment, there are going to be a lot of disappointed people. There are going to be a lot of people who thought they were sheep, who thought that because they were religious and they knew their Bibles, they will be saved unto eternal life. There are a lot of people who think they are sheep when in truth they are goats, not the greatest of all time, but rather those who did not listen to the voice of the shepherd. Jesus, who is the Messiah, came to deliver people from sin and to save them unto eternal life, to give them a hope that will not disappoint. It is only uh, the Messiah who can grant us such a hope, such eternal security. Look at what Jesus says. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I wonder, do you know the difference between religion and Christianity? Religion is spelled D-O, do. Religion is what I do to earn eternal life with the Father, what I do to earn my salvation. The problem is we can never do enough because we need to be perfect. Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E, done. Christianity is what has been done to save sinners from sin and death and God's judgment. Christianity is what Jesus Christ has done in my place, in your place, for our salvation. And sheep know that everything depends on Jesus and what Jesus the Messiah has done for them. The sheep know the voice of the Messiah, and they follow him. Do you know the voice of the Messiah today? Are you following Jesus because you know he is the only one who, who de can deliver you from sin and death and God's judgment? There's no other Messiah but Jesus. There's no other who can give us a, an assurance of salvation unto eternal life with the Father. Do you know that assurance that only Jesus can give? And isn't it true in this life we strive for security and safety and protection from all manner of risk and danger? That's why we have PIN codes and passwords and security questions and alarms in our cars and alarms on our houses and triple lock doors and all that sort of stuff. But sometimes the thing we overlook is that spiritual security. That's the only security that will get us eternal life. And Jesus the Messiah gave his life so we could have an eternal security, an eternal safety, an eternal protection from the dangers of sin, death, and God's judgment. Only through Jesus can you know this security. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is also the Son Jesus referred to his Father and then declared, I and the Father are one. Later he would say, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And this declaration of Jesus caused offense in the first century, caused offense to those who, who, to whom Jesus was speaking. It causes offense today to say that Jesus is the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. Unitarianism does not believe in the divine nature of Jesus. Islam does not believe that Jesus is God. Cults like the Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses do not believe Jesus is the only and eternal Son of God, fully God and fully human. And if we were to, to preach that Jesus is God to any of these groups, well, they mightn't take up physical stones, but they might throw a few verbal stones at us. And as the Jews heard Jesus say that he and the Father are one, they picked up stones to stone him. And Jesus wanted to know for which of his many works they were going to stone him. The Jews declared they were going to stone Jesus for blasphemy, 
for saying he was God. They were not going to stone him for his many works, which showed he was God. They were going to stone Jesus for claiming to be God. That's a bit like accusing Pep Guardiola of being mad if he claims to be one of the greatest managers of all time while ignoring his many achievements in three different countries. But Jesus replied to this accusation of blasphemy by quoting and interpreting Psalm 82 and verse 6. In that verse we read, You are gods, you are all sons of the Most High. As difficult as this is to understand, the most likely interpretation is that it speaks of Israel's leaders as being gods, as those who had a God-given role in the life of Israel. And so the argument goes that if God called Israel's leaders gods, how much more appropriate is it for the Son of God to speak of himself in this way? And Jesus again says, look at what I've done. Remember the things I have done. And perhaps, perhaps his listeners had witnessed Jesus healing the paralyzed man who was lowered down through the roof. Remember what Jesus said to the man, friend, your sins are forgiven. But of course, on that occasion, Jesus was also accused of blasphemy because only God can forgive sins. And Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, said, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. John tells us at the very end of his gospel the reason why he wrote his gospel. And he wrote his gospel so that people like us would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, religious people still find it hard to believe that Jesus is is the Messiah and the Son of God. But we cannot sit on the fence when it comes to what we think of Jesus. He is either the Messiah and Son of God, or he's not. We can't say he might be. We can't say he possibly would be. We can't say he has the potential to become that. C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, once wrote that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or who he says he is. Can't have all three. Can only have one. We read that after this encounter, Jesus withdrew from Jerusalem, traveled back across the Jordan River where John the Baptist once ministered. We read that many people came to Jesus and agreed that everything John said about Jesus was true, and many believed in him. Isn't it interesting? in the place and among the people that you would expect belief in Jesus as the Messiah and Son of God, there's hostility. But in the wilderness, there is openness. Openness to Jesus. Belief in Him as the Messiah and Son of God. And as we come to an end, there's a warning and a calling for us in the church to think about. There's a warning about the danger of religion or believing in ourselves, or trusting ourselves to earn our salvation, to earn forgiveness for sin and peace with God through our religious activity. There's a danger of saying, I have enough religion to get me through. We will never have enough religion to get us through because our religion needs to be perfect to get us through, and none of us are perfect. But there's also a warning for us in the church that the place where belief in Jesus as the Messiah and Son of God is assumed, it still may not be evident. Because many who profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord live as if they are atheists in their everyday lives, chasing after the things of this world, wanting what the world offers and promises, living only for what the world offers and promises, storing up treasure on earth where moths and rust can eat and destroy rather than storing up treasure in heaven. That Jesus is the Messiah and Son of God means everything changes. Everything should change about our lives, our priorities, our relationships. Jesus saves us to be part of the flock. Yet how easily we can neglect even the flock we're meant to be a part of. 
But there's also a calling, and the calling is to give verbal witness to Jesus as John the Baptist had done, that those who hear may come to know that everything that was said of Jesus is true. The world in which we live is a spiritual wilderness. The cities of these islands are spiritual wastelands. The towns and villages uh, are spiritual wastelands in this land. And we sometimes wonder, will any believe the gospel? But Jesus has promised that he has sheep waiting to be gathered into the flock. But here's the other thing. Jesus also has sheep who need to go and tell the good news of a true shepherd of a gate for the sheep and the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. Will we be that kind of people which testify concerning Jesus, the Messiah, and the Son of God? Will we be that kind of people of whom others will say of us, everything they said about Jesus was true, and I believe in him? Will we be that kind of people the Lord can use to draw others unto saving faith in Jesus and into the flock that is the church. Let us pray. Our God, we thank you for your word to our lives this day. We thank you that from your word you speak the truth of who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God and the Messiah, the true and good shepherd of and gate for the sheep, the true and only Savior of sinners. Our God, in a society which is increasingly ignorant of you and your word, increasingly ignorant of Jesus, increasingly apathetic toward the church, we pray, Father, that we are being formed according to the truth of your word, so that we will hold firm to the truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do, and that we would bear witness before others concerning Jesus, his person, and his work. We pray, Father, that we will not be blown and tossed by the winds of current or popular opinion, but know that we are anchored firm and deep in the truth of your word, in the truth of who Jesus is, and in his love. Hear our prayer, for we pray in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Our closing praise this morning is hymn number 641, hymn 641, Tell All the World of Jesus.
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day until Christ calls or comes, and then forevermore. Amen.